it's nice to see all of you here. I know lots of you. I'm going to begin by reading the first chapter, which is entitled, I Got One, But It Didn't Help. In the early hours of Wednesday, October 26th, 1966, Mary Partington huddled under the blankets and tried not to hear the noise of a prowler in her lonely farmhouse north of Lincoln, Nebraska. 77 years old, she had slept in this bedroom for 40 years. The first 20 had been peaceful, but now vandals had been breaking her windows, painting obscene words on the side of her house, and even attacking her. Someone had gotten in and tied her with rope. Who had come to torment her now? The noises persisted. Why didn't the sheriff come? She had called nearly an hour ago. No sirens. Now a thud on the side of the house, breaking glass. Mary bolted upright, grabbed her wire-rimmed glasses off the bedside table. The floor felt cold. She stepped into black high-topped shoes, grabbed her 12-gauge Meriden firearms single shot. She'd loaded it with number six shot that came in those blue plastic casings. This should be enough to scare them. Her flashlight in one hand, shotgun in the other, she crept downstairs. When Mary entered her dark kitchen, she, heard the, she saw the head of a person silhouetted in the large broken pane of the shadowless window. Mary aimed and fired. The figure dropped away. She turned around, believing she'd frightened the intruder away, leaned the shotgun into the corner, and dialed the sheriff's office again. When the sheriff's office heard Mary's first call that morning, the officers assigned to her area were a mile north and three miles west of Centerville, Nebraska, a long way from the Partington Farmstead on 44th and Superior. The sheriff's department turned to the Lincoln police, even though Mary's place was not yet in the city. The police were familiar enough with Mary's vandalism problems. Breaking an entry had happened again and again. The old woman shouldn't be living alone. Now she was developing into a legend. It wasn't only the harassments. The kids seemed to make it a rite of passage to go out and rile her. Crazy old woman in a house out of the early 1900s. Lincoln police officer Lieutenant Satterwaite, who arrived at Mary's house, first said, I went to the front door because I grew up in the area and had seen Mary many times at Green Service Station. I felt I sort of knew her. Actually, she was well known to all in law enforcement because of the stories and rumors that circulated about her. Mary was nervous and scared like anyone would have been, but she was not hysterical when we arrived. Mary had been victim of dare games and double dare games for years. The dare was simply to sneak up to her house and steal some item, even a shingle, without you hearing her her hearing you. The double dare included walking down 44th Street in the dark to Pigman's, a fellow down the road about a mile. With Salt Creek in the vicinity, many of us worried that there would be a drowning out there someday. We sealed off the area because when we arrived, we found a man lying straight back, his feet next to a crock jar he'd apparently stood on to look into the house. Maybe he'd been window peeking. The reason for his being there was silenced when Mary hit him in the face with the gunshot. He had a hole in his right cheek and had died instantly. I remember there was a large full moon the night of the shooting, so the victim would have been well silhouetted in the brightness of the night. Once members of the sheriff's department and Paul Douglas and William Blue from the county attorney's office had arrived, those of us from the police department left. William Blue, the chief deputy county attorney, described it this way. I remember Sheriff Carnop and I getting out of our car and walking to the front door. It was extremely dark. The house seemed dark, even though it was lit with kerosene lamps. Mary greeted us at the door. She said to Sheriff Carnop, see, you told me if I got a phone, that would solve this problem. I got one, but it didn't help. Mary had resisted electricity and plumbing and had preferred living in her isolated rural setting. Blue continued, when I got to Mary's house, it was as though I stepped out of one era and entered another because her home was furnished with antiques and kerosene lamps. I was called to accompany Sheriff Carnop to investigate the possibility of a homicide, but Mary was never charged. Paul Douglas, Lancaster County Attorney, remembered the evening well. Sheriff Carnop and I went out there to investigate the reported shooting. The kitchen was dark, so I used my flashlight to look around. There was glass lying on the sink and the floor, so it appeared the window had been broken from the outside. Mary was her usual self. By that I mean she was no raving maniac. 
A direct woman, Mary told Carnup and me about what had happened. Mary said, I'd been upstairs in my bedroom, waiting for the sheriff because I called them earlier when I heard prowling noises. When I heard glass breaking, I got up and came downstairs, carrying my shotgun, which I keep beside my bed. When I reached the first floor, I put my gun next to the casing, door casing near the telephone and called the sheriff's office. When I hung up the phone, I heard more glass breaking, and I saw someone in the west window of the kitchen, so I picked up my shotgun, and a voice said, we will fight. I didn't know what to do. I thought he was by the sink in the house. I was frightened and I pulled the trigger. He disappeared, so I called the sheriff's department again. Earl Eldon Hill, the man who came to Mary's looking for some unknown reason, found death. He came in a 1960 blue Ford Fairlane and left in a Roper's mortuary hearse, heading for St. Elizabeth Hospital in an autopsy. Officers checked the Fairlane to see if Hill had run out of gas. There was gas, but no keys. In fact, they never did find the Fairlane fair lane ignition keys. Sheriff Carnop phoned Mary's nephew, Lee Partington, to come be with Mary. When the officers left that night, they took Mary's shotgun with them. Lee recalled, I went to Aunt Mary's because my dad was ill and couldn't go. My dad, James, was Mary's brother. They were very close and he often stopped in at Mary's. We were upset when we got the call that somebody had been shot out at Mary's. I went right out. For several years, we'd been trying to get Mary to move into town, but she would have nothing to do with the idea even though she couldn't take care of herself very well. She was 77, but Mary was independent, self-sufficient, and didn't like others to make her decisions. I remember her so well that night, sitting there all hunched over. I asked her if she would come home with me for a few days. She straightened up, looked at me through those wire rim glasses, and said, you have things to do, and I have things to do. You can go on home. When Mrs. Virginia Hill came to Lincoln to claim the personal belongings of her son, Earl, the eighth child in a family of 12, she related some of his history. We were farm parents. Earl had a normal life through grammar school, but all my children knew a father who allowed them no luxuries, only life's necessities. Eldon wanted to participate in 4-H so he could compete in livestock raising, but this was not allowed by his father. My son was quiet, well-mannered, but extremely shy about girls. Eldon and his recent girlfriend had separated three times the last year. A year after he graduated from high school, Eldon ran away from home and attempted to join the service, but he experienced some mental problems. About 1961, Eldon moved to Lincoln, where he lived with the brother of his girlfriend. The relationship with his girlfriend developed into problems. A few days before the shooting, his roommate said Eldon was a man in a haze. Two days before that night, he had been to a minister to discuss his problems. Earl Eldon Hill did work for a Lincoln construction firm, but he had been in and out of St. Elizabeth Medical Center several times. Three times he had been a mental patient at the state hospital in Clorinda, Iowa. Several days after the death of Hill, Paul Douglas announced that there would be no criminal charges filed in connection with the shotgun slaying of the former Iowa mental patient, Earl Eldon Hill. Douglas said later in an interview, the event was clearly justifiable homicide. The guy was breaking and entering. Mary clearly had the right to defend herself. But the title Bloody Mary now took on new meaning for hundreds of young imaginations. The teasing and taunting continued and the thrill increased. Mary lived 11 more years on the farm in the firm belief she had the right to live her life as she chose in her home. So what developed this woman into the legend that she was? And that was the, that was the uh, quest that my fifth and sixth grade students and I started in 1984. And the way that started uh, was this. A Guide to the Ghosts of Lincoln was published. And I had been on sabbatical writing the other book, Story Teaching, which has never been published, just parts of it. Um, and I came back after the uh, winter holiday and the kids asked me about those stories. Well, are they true? Which of these stories are true? And they wanted to know especially about Bloody Mary because some of them had heard stories about Bloody Mary. And I, I told them that um, I had read that story about Bloody Mary and that some of it was true, but most of it wasn't. And they wanted to know how we could find out more about it. And I gave the question right back to them and said, well, how can we find out more about it? And they thought it would be good if we could find anybody who had known her. 
and I thought that was a great idea and they then came up with the idea that we make a list of possible relatives and I knew what her name had been, Mary Partington, and so we went right to the phone book and looked up the Partington family and so we called Lee and Carol Partington and they were most gracious and allowed us to come for an interview and that was a wonderful interview which started us going and then um, we interviewed people who had been neighbors to Mary especially a farm couple from Davie Grace and I can't think of his name Smith who lived out at Davie and they came and spent an afternoon with my students and it was just like a Johnny Carson talk show my kids had prepared the, like 20 questions and and asked these people these questions and we taped the whole interview it was most exciting because the kids were getting real answers. And their questions were the questions that everybody has. You know, what made her this way? Had she ever been married? Um, was she really a loner? Was she really a witch? All those kinds of things. And these people clarified for the kids that Mary was certainly not a witch. She was uh, the oldest daughter of a family of eight children, a very enterprising family, who lived at 44th and Superior. And her father had been a dairy farmer and acquired the land acre by acre. And they, they built a little dynasty out there uh, with hard, hard work. They were a partly Irish Catholic and partly English Anglican. Uh, her father was uh, uh, English. And they, uh, they were rather... Um, to themselves people. They, 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 their family seemed to be the center of their life. Well, there were eight children. Anyway, they lived um, south of 44th Street for uh, many years, and then in 1906, when Mary was already 20 years old, they built the mansion. It was called at that time the most modern farmhouse in Lancaster County because Mr. Partington was so enterprising that he figured out a way to run a siphon system from Salt Creek to the house. So they had indoor plumbing and an upstairs bathroom you know at the turn of the century which was absolutely unheard of and so they had running water and they had all the modern conveniences they traveled to England to acquire um, the chandeliers the oak wainscoting that went into the house and part of the oak um, stairwell and some of the leaded glass that they put in the house. Apparently the house was beautiful. The carpets were brilliant red. One of the rooms was a music room. Every Partington child played some musical instrument. They were all um, educated in the classics. They went to school at Unai Place and graduated from Unai High when Unai High uh, graduated people. Mary didn't graduate from Unai High because they only went to 10th grade when she was in high school. And she must have stayed out of school for a couple of years before she graduated from high school because she didn't graduate until she was 20. And she graduated at Wesleyan Academy. Well, of course, you know, the choices for women in those days when they graduated from high school was to go out and teach. You went to a normal school and you quickly got a... Uh, emergency certificate and you became a teacher and so Mary and her three oldest sisters were in schools by the time they were 22 years old teaching the first place Mary taught was at a rural school near Wa where Waverly is now and then the second one was um, near rather near where their home is now it was within walking distance or carriage distance of the house well time went along and of course everybody was growing up Mary was the oldest and apparently a, a rather bossy person. The, the, er, the younger people in the family remember that Mary was bossy. Mary has one sister, I believe, who is still alive, Grace, and she, um, she would not uh, grant interviews to the children and me. She told us that uh, she wouldn't do that because uh, she wouldn't perpetuate the misery of her sister's life. Well, she did let me come, though, finally to the house one day and showed me all kinds of wonderful pictures, which I just had to have for this book but she told me I would not be allowed those pictures she wouldn't give them to me but she did talk to me for a little while and told me some wonderful stories especially stories about how it was to be out there in the country and be able to watch the development of Lincoln. They would sit on this great wraparound porch and, and watch the Burr Building being constructed, watch the Capitol being constructed, watch the fireworks out at um, what is now Capitol Beach, and, um, of course, all the lights from the railroad. That was the main part of their, their uh, uh, 
life was that world they lived out that that rural rural world hi hi and um so uh, time went along, and uh, Mary uh, went away to teach, and her sisters went away, and then finally the girls wanted to buy a car. And their father said, no, they didn't need a car. They didn't need a modern convenience like, like a car. The carriage would do just fine, the horse and buggy carriage. But Mary and her sisters thought, no, it would be fun if they got a, a car, which they were just going to sort of tool around in. They weren't going to really drive at places like to their schools. And um, so the three oldest girls went together and bought a car. And Mary was apparently a really big risk taker because she took jobs uh, all over the country for that period of time. She went to uh, Moorcroft, Wyoming to teach. She went to um, Ogallala. She went to... Um, northern Minnesota in the hinterlands to a place near Lake Winnebagoshish. Can you imagine such a place? And the last part of her journey, she had to go on a ferry. And she she took a job that the, the, the superintendent told her right away, well, you know, we're glad to have you. I want you to know that the last person um, had a lot of trouble and um, it was mostly over religion and we had to let her go. And Mary just told him, there won't be any trouble here. And I do have some wonderful stories that I didn't include in this book, I didn't get to include in this book, uh, about uh, Mary's relationship with the family that she lived with that year. But then she wanted to come back to Nebraska and finish her uh, undergraduate degree, which she did. Now, Mary's, Mary and all of her sisters and brothers walked from the farm to the University of Nebraska, and they all graduated from the university, except for her oldest brother, James. And Mary apparently said at one time, he, he got married real young. Well, he got his own sort of education. She just never could abide that he hadn't gotten his degree and had married early. Well, he is the man who started the Partington Trading Post, which you can still see on North 27th. The sign is still there. I just went by it the other day and thought, oh, they've painted over it, but they hadn't. It's still on the front. It no longer belongs to the Partington family, though. But James did start that. But see, what he first started was a seed and feed company. So that great big building next to it was his, first of all, that seed and feed company and then eventually he started the trading post. And then his son, Lee, whom we, uh, who was great help to me, um, uh, took over that business and kept it until about 1989. And then he stopped that business. So uh, anyway, Mary, well, anyway, Mary's family, you know, eventually the girls started to go off and get married and... Um, the boys went uh, away, and pretty soon there was just Mary and her sister uh, Grace, her youngest sister Grace, and um, her brother Joe, and her sister who, Mabel. Mabel is the one who's still alive. Mabel. And so they were at the farm together, and Mary's mother became ill with a terrible flu and was weakened. So Mary left her teaching post at Ogallala to come home. She took a year's leave of absence to come home and sort of take care of her mother. And a crazy thing happened. The girls had gone to St. Patrick's to a holy day service in the car. But Mary and her mother had not gone along. So on the way home, see, that was just a sea of mud in North Lincoln at that time. And it was a spring, a quick thaw, and the car got stuck in the mud to the hubcaps. So Mary and her mother could see from the farmhouse, could see that the girls were stuck, and they started to go up, down the road. And Mary decided that her mother would push, and she would steer the car. Her mother would help push with the girls. So that's what had happened, and her mother was overcome during this pushing, and by the time they got her into the car, she was dead. And that seemed to traumatize Mary unduly. She just, she never drove a car again. But Mary took the bus from the farm into Unai Place and then walked to uh, where Grace lived over by St. Teresa's Church every day of her life, the four years that her father was there, and bathed him and fed him and read to him and brought his mail and then went back. She did that for four years. And then when he died, uh, Mary was really alone out there because in the meantime, Mabel had found a husband. 
And so there was Mary. And she just sort of stayed. She didn't inherit the house, but she had inherited the land, which is now Isco's land. So Mary just stayed there. She by now was rather eccentric. She had never really joined the 20th century. She wore um, odd clothes. She was very single-minded. She wore clothes out of the 19th century, sort of long skirts and hats. And she drove, rode this little blue bike that was too little for her. And she was a rather large woman, I hear. And she would tootle off into Lincoln and attend every possible, she'd be here tonight. She would be at every possible function she could get to. She never missed the city county meetings. She was politically involved in everything. She was just furious when the decision was made to drain the lake that was behind the Partington house because of the Salt Creek Diversion Project and she got all of her sisters and brothers to come to that meeting and protest that they had to drain the lake. <clears throat> and um, so she was an extremely active woman. She was a writer she was a painter and she wrote unending letters to the editor of the Lincoln Papers. Now, when did the trouble start, though? Well, nobody can really zero it in, but apparently it started in the late 50s. And some people who seem to know think that uh, it might have started as a sorority or fr fraternity uh, rites of passage deal, go out there. See, one of the things that was really interesting was this man that the people called the pig man who lived down the road on North 44th. Now, he had really nothing to do with Mary. This is how he started. There were two brothers in Lincoln in the late 40s who started a garbage pickup. Very enterprising guys, and they had a pickup, and they came around and just picked up garbage, and then they took it out to this land on North 44th, which they rented from Mr. Partington. And uh, then they thought, well, we can get a bunch of pigs to eat the garbage, and we'll become very rich. And that's what they did. They got a large bunch of pigs, and then they had to get somebody to sort of watch over the pigs. And that, that little place where the pig man lived was kind of north of Mary's, about a half a mile, and there's a dip in the road there that you can, you, I, don't gear, I don't suggest you do it. But you can drive out there, and you get into that dip, and I swear that that pig mud is still there. You know, you can drive down there and be stuck up to your hubcaps. That happened to me while I was writing this book. I was going out there at all different times of the day and night so I could get a feeling of this place. And then one time I thought, well, you know, I've never seen the sunset out there. I guess I'll just go out there tonight and watch the sunset. And it was a summer night. And I drove down that road and got stuck in that mire. And then I thought, now what am I going to do? It was, it was quite spooky. Uh, the sun was setting, and uh, it's a long ways. I mean, especially when you're out there all by yourself, it's a long ways back down 44th South where there are houses. But I thought, well, I have no choice. I have to go find a phone, and uh, I just hope the police don't come by and find me. They're going to ask me all kinds of questions about what I'm doing out here. But I walked down that road, and finally I came to a yard, and there was a man in the yard. And I, I said, oh, sir, could you possibly help me? I've really got myself in a terrible fix. And he said, you do? What's the matter? And I said, well, I, and I told him I was working on this book, and I was up at the uh, old Partington homestead, and I was stuck in the mud. And he laughed, and he said, you and I've still got the tow rope and the pickup from pulling hundreds of kids out of there <laughs> years and years on end. So he came up there and took me out and then told me some great stories, which are included in this book. His children and sons love Mary. Well, anyway, there seems to be, you know, like two pictures of Mary that emerged as the research continued. One is, of course, of this witch woman who had a herd of fierce guard goats that would attack you, and she would shoot at you and probably kill you and bury you in the backyard. The other is of this absolutely kind woman who loved to visit about her family and who would talk your ear off if you happened to get to know her. Now, I have never met a person who knew Mary who didn't love her. That is the truth. Of all the people I interviewed, anybody who ever knew Mary has really endearing feelings about her. But then there's the other side where people created the myth. It just, it grew. You know, it grew with kids needing some fun. This time of the year was great. The police and uh, sheriff accounts and newspaper accounts of what happened at Mary's in October and November are just long, many, varied. From shooting out all the windows 
uh, to shooting at Mary. Mary was actually shot in the stomach uh, standing at her upstairs window one time. And that's another really unbelievable story. Uh, I'll tell you that in a minute. But uh, it went from that to people daring each other to sneak in the house and steal something. You know, Mary's mother had beautiful china from England. And there was an oak wa uh, wainscoting, not uh, dish plate railing all around the living room. And it was filled with beautiful china. And the kids knew that. They could see in the windows because Mary didn't have many curtains on the windows. And she just had that kerosene lamp. So if they looked in and it was dark out there, they could see what was in there quite plainly. And that was another double dare and I've met people who own some of that china and then um, just to go in the house was a real great thrill now it's hard to come by people who will admit to having gone into the house but I did meet a few of those uh, and anyway this intruder incident that happened that's the first chapter is unrelated to all of these uh, kids who went out there to torment Mary he didn't seem to have a thing to do with the kids maybe he'd heard of Bloody Mary because I think everybody who lived in Lincoln in the 60s and 70s heard about Bloody Mary I certainly did in the 70s the kids at Elliott had me just scared telling me stories about Bloody Mary and um, so I thought I'd drive out there one night, you know, and just see what I could see. But I have to admit, the only time I ever saw the house, I was too frightened to drive close enough to even see it very well. It was eerie. It was, there were no lights out there. It was just eerie. So I didn't, that's the only time I ever came close to the real house. All the other things are just through pictures. I had to reconstruct everything through pictures and stories people told me. But anyway, kids talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. And I started to collect newspaper articles and stories from parents who had been out there. And then I let it go, as I say, until 1984 when the kids got me interested again. Well, I didn't really set out to write a book. I just set out to answer, help the kids answer their questions. But when the year came to an end, the kids were so involved, they hardly wanted the school year to be over. You know, how, how will it ever all get finished? We've, it's got to be a whole book everybody can read. We've found out so much. Well, we thought we had found out a lot until the publishers got a hold of it. And then I found out that we had a, I had a lot more that I, I had to go find out. And that primarily is because it's a true story and many of Mary's relatives are alive. We had to take, we couldn't take any risks of any, of any fabrication or any assumptions about about Mary, her family, or any of those people. I want to tell you about Mary being shot in the stomach, which is an interesting story. We, we have no idea who shot her, but um, she was shot, and the police did receive a call that night from the steakhouse out on Cornhusker that um, a person had been shot out at the Partington Farm. And so the sheriffs went out there, and they went up and down the roads and looked into all the ditches with searchlights and everything and found nobody. Well, who was shot was Mary, and she was up in her bedroom. And this is what she did. This illustrates how really tough Mary was. She said that, uh, yes, she looked at her belly and saw some blood, blood coming out, but she went downstairs and put some liniment on it and a poultice over it and went up to bed. She was tired. The kids had been harassing her all night. So she went to bed and went to sleep, and she slept through the night. And in the morning, a woman from a trailer park east of Mary's had lost her little dog and was looking for her dog, and she was around Mary's yard calling for this dog. And so Mary came out on the porch to ask this woman what she was doing, and the woman said, well, I'm looking for my little dog and I she was pretty upset having lost the dog and Mary said well you should know what's happened to me I've been sh shot in the stomach <laughs> so the woman then left and made a phone call and um, to a relative who came and got Mary they took Mary to Lincoln General which was down on south at that time south and 17th okay and Dr. Y. Scott Moore I found out later he told me this he was the person who removed the bullet and he said he removed the bullet and they visited all during this little interaction physical interaction and uh, when it was all over he said he found out later that Mary left his office and walked back to the farm walked back to the farm that's the way he, that's how strong that Mary Partington was and um, well anyway somewhere along the line according to the Smith family Orville Smith who by the way is a nephew of uh, the Lincoln historian from Lee's books, booksellers, Jim McKee. And he's the one who sent me to the Orville Smiths. 
Well, Orville Smith told me that he, after Mary's front um, picture window type of window, it wasn't a picture window really in a house of that nature, but it was a great big front window had been shot out and some of the neighbors took big boards up there and boarded that window up. They told Mary, you know what? If you're going to stay here, you have to arm yourself. You can't stay here alone anymore. You have no phone. You have no electricity. You can't be out here like this. And so he told me that he and several neighbors taught her to shoot. They took her to the barn, and she was never a very good shot. The family says, well, they didn't know if that exactly was the truth, because Mary, there were always guns out there. In the first place, in early day, the place was alive with rattlesnakes, because it was hay country. And... Um, they all knew how to shoot a gun and that there were guns around there and Mary might have just activated an old gun that was in one of the sheds because she had actually shot a rattlesnake when her little sister Grace was like five years old to save her sister's life. So Mary wasn't really afraid of things and many people attest to that, that they never knew a woman who was so unafraid of things as Mary Partington. She just wasn't afraid of things. So uh, how it started, I don't. We don't really actually know. They're just that. That also remains kind of a mystery. But it did go on until 1977, and then in 1977, Mary's uh, niece, Grace's daughter, uh, talked Mary into moving into Lincoln. She said, "You know, you just can't stay out here anymore." And this Gra uh, Grace's niece loved her aunt Mary, loved her, and uh, she did convince Mary to leave the farm. And so Mary left the farm and went to a rooming house near Vine Street and was only there a short while when she fell and broke her hip. So then she went to Madonna. She was at this point 88 years old. And she did live in Madonna to be 90, and even her death is a story. The nurses out there tell that the morning that she died, she wheeled herself out to breakfast and had a nice breakfast and then told everybody that she was going to go back to her room and take a little rest. And uh, she wheeled herself back and, oh, she told everybody in the, uh, in the cafeteria she was going to die that day. And so then she wheeled herself back into her room and uh, some nurse heard her saying the Our Father and the next thing they knew she had died. So, but people who knew her out at Madonna say they used to say to her, how could a sweet little lady like you get a name like Bloody Mary? They just loved her to pieces. So there are a lot of mysteries still connected with Mary, actually, but uh, she was essentially um, an old maid, the oldest uh, daughter of a large family. She sort of inherited that uh, job of responsibility and just sort of fell into it after she... Um, took over after her mother had died. Um, there's just lots of wonderful stories that keep coming to me, and I promise to tell one of them. I could tell stories all night about it. Since I've written the book, I have enough stories to write another one, because now people call me all the time. And about a week ago, a man called me, and he said, are you that woman that wrote that book? And I said, what book? Well, that Bloody Mary book, yes. Well, you couldn't be. Your name in the phone book is Francis J. Reiner. I said, I know, because I, that's just a, I know that. But I am the woman who wrote the book. He said, uh, well, you know what? I know the guys that burnt that house down that night. And I said, oh, you do? Would you like to tell me about them? No, he said, I don't want to tell you about them. I just want you to know I know those guys. <laughs> So, um, but he said, I think, I think that uh, they were going to burn that place down anyway. They could never get it sold, you know. Well, after Mary left, the family did have it up for sale. And because it was on such prime hayland, they had a huge price on it, 140000 And they didn't get it sold. But eventually... Uh, the Partington family sold the land to the Lincoln Foundation, and the Lincoln Foundation in turn bequeathed the land to, I think, the Lincoln Parks and Recreation Department, and that land is being brought back to its original state, or as close to its original state as, as it can be, and in about seven years, it will become the Helen Busalis Park, and it will be sort of like wilderness. There will be bike trails and walking trails, and right now, it's pretty rough country to go out there. I, I usually like to take a walk out there every fall just sort of say hello to her spirit you know I feel like I really got to know her and last fall when I went out there I um was walking around out there and I picked a whole big bouquet of, of uh, you know, dried flowers about this time of the year and I was walking back up that draw to my car and somebody drove by and hollered, hey, Bloody Mary, it's great to see you're back. 
work. <laughs> so, it, like I say, the, the, the legend will live a lot longer than the real story, but the real story is pretty interesting too. Well, I really thank all of you for coming. It was really nice.